If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. How do you even start raising private money? I can tell you where you start. You got to get your head straight. I tell people all the time, you can't own real estate until you own the real estate between your ears. So we got to get the mindset right. Are you like most sales and other professionals who want to grow their wealth faster than what they are currently doing through their company 401k, even with that company match, the stock market, or just plain saving money? Would you sleep better at night if you had the financial freedom to be job optional in just three to five years through investing in real assets. Maybe you don't want to stop working, but wouldn't it be cool if you could retire a decade earlier than most and do the traveling you and your family have planned for years while you're still young and can enjoy it? Let's face it, most busy professionals don't have the time or desire to take on more work outside of their W-2 to grow their wealth. On The Wealth Flow, each week we share the stories the investments, and take a deep dive into the various asset classes that can deliver that accelerated growth to your portfolio passively. That's right, no extra work for you. Instead, we'll put your money to work. Learn what the 95% aren't talking about and join the top 5% of earners today on The Wealth Flow. Okay, welcome to The Wealth Flow. My guest today is Jay Connor. Jay has been buying and selling houses since 2003 in a town of only 40,000 people with profits now averaging $78,000 per deal. He has rehabbed over 475 houses He's been involved in over $118 million in transactions. Jay has completely automated his annual seven-figure income business to where he works in his buying and selling houses, businesses, and to just 10 hours a week. Can't wait to hear about that, Jay. And then his passion is motivating and teaching other real estate investors how to raise private money without ever asking for it. As a result, Jay has consulted one-on-one -on -one with over 2,000 real estate investors. When he lost his line of credit back in 2009, Jay raised $2,150,000 in less than 90 days in private money when cut off from the banks. Jay is also a commercial developer of shopping centers and condominium communities. He's a national speaker on topics of private money, foreclosures this side of COVID, and automation of your business, and personal development. In addition, Jay is a two-time national best-selling author and a past president of the Business Network International. Jay, welcome to The Wealth Flow. Hello, Keith. Thank you so much for inviting me to come along and my lands. We're going to be talking today about my favorite subject I'm so passionate about, that being private money and private lending. And I'm so passionate about it because it's made more of a difference in our real estate investing business than any other strategy or business practice that we do. That's fantastic. I always like, Jay, to really start with kind of where you grew up and what eventually got you into real estate. Sure. Well, I grew up here in Eastern North Carolina, and actually, I grew up around my dad and his company, which was he was in mobile homes or manufactured housing. And Keith, you being out there in Texas, you've probably seen a few mobile homes along the hillside of, out there in Texas. Well, the mobile home business, manufactured housing, if you will, was very good to our family for many, many years. In fact, my dad's company was the largest retailer of manufactured homes, that being affordable housing, for many, many years. But then, unfortunately, the financing for that product went away for the consumer. So I knew if I ever got out of manufactured housing and mobile homes, I wanted to get into single-family houses. And so it was in 2003 that my wife, Carol Joy, and I started investing in single-family houses 
here in Eastern North Carolina. Our first year in 2003, we only did three flips and I relied on the local banks to fund our deals. That's all I knew to do. And so from 2003 until 2009, the first six years that we were here in the business investing in single family houses, we relied on institutional money, local banks to fund our deals. But then something happened in January 2009 that changed everything. And what would that be, Jay? Well, I don't know if you want me to tell that story now or not. <laughs> no, 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 please do. Please do. <laughs> because that changed everything. You know, I remember it just like it was yesterday. I was sitting here at my desk, this very desk, January 2009. It may be hard to believe, but we actually still have handsets and cords attached to telephones here. I, a lot of people don't even know what a landline is. But I was sitting here and I picked up the phone and I called my banker. His name was Steve. I'd called my banker many times on deals for six years. I called him up and Keith, I told him about these two houses that I had under contract to close on. So I told him about the deals like I'd done for six years and, you know, the funding required and when I wanted to close. Well, I learned very quickly like that on that telephone conversation that the bank had closed my line of credit with no notice. And I said, Steve, I said, what do you mean? Why are you closing my line of credit with no notice? He said, Jay, don't you know there's a global financial crisis going on right now worldwide and everything is shutting down? I said, no, Steve, I didn't know that. But now you just gave me a global financial crisis in my own little world to where I can't fund my deals, right? He said, sorry, Jay, not loaning money out to real estate investors anymore. So my first thought was, you know, I sure wish I had known my line of credit had been closed before I put earnest money down on these two properties. And then my second thought was, what am I going to do? Now, let me tell you something, Keith. I can't stand these people running around all the time saying, oh, every problem's an opportunity. I want to throw up. I didn't have an opportunity. I had a problem right? This was a problem. So I sat here, I sat here for a second and I thought to myself, and here's a rider downer for those of you that are listening. Anytime you got a problem, here's how to fix your problem. I asked myself, who do I know that can help me with my problem? And I immediately thought of Jeff Blankenship, who lived in Greensboro, North Carolina at the time. He and I were really, really good friends and still are. He was investing in real estate back then. And I called him up and I told him what had just happened, losing my line of credit at the bank. And he said, well, welcome to the club, Jay. I said, what club? He said, the club of being shut down with the bank. They shut me down last week. And I said, well, how are you going to fund your deals? He said, well, have you ever heard of private money? And I said, no. He said, have you ever heard of self-directed IRAs? I said, no. So he told me a little bit about them. And I started studying private money and private lending and how people can use their investment capital to make high rates of return safely and securely. And in addition to that, how people can use their retirement funds that they've already got and transfer them over to a self-directed IRA and then invest in real estate totally passively. So I put together, Keith, what I call my private lending program. So what's my private lending program? My program is what I teach other people how to be a private lender. You know, it's interesting. Carol Joy and I right now have 47 private lenders, individuals, human beings that are loaning us money, investing in our deals. And you know what, Keith? Not one of them had ever heard of private money and private lending until I put on my teacher hat and I started teaching people what private money is. Here's the interesting thing. You know, the traditional way to borrow money for real estate is you go to the bank or you go to the hard money lender or traditional lender and you get on your hands and knees and you put your hands underneath your chin and you say, please fund my deal, right? Applications, credit score, verification of income and all that. Here's the interesting thing, Keith. In this world of private money, the way I do it and the way so many other people do it now that I've been able to teach how to do it, we don't ask for a mortgage. We offer a mortgage. You see, when I was borrowing money from the banks, they made the rules. The bank set the interest rate. The bank set the frequency of payments. The bank made the rules. But guess what? In this world of private money, 
We make the rules. It's my program. I'm teaching it. I'm offering it. I've never asked for money since I lost my line of credit. And I'll finish my sentence with this and turn it back to you, Keith. People ask me all the time, they say, Jay, how do you have $8.5 million of funding for your real estate deals that you use from project to project to project, and you never ask for money? Here's the secret sauce and the secret answer. I separate the conversation between teaching people. That's how I raised $2,150,000 when I was cut off. I just started sharing with people that in my own network, people I go to church with, people in the Rotary Club, people in Business Networking International, that I now opened up my real estate investing business to people that I know and trust. And here's how you can make high rates of return safely and securely. So I'd teach what the interest rate is I was paying, how they're protected, how they can get their money back in case of an emergency. But I didn't bring up a deal in the conversation because you see, here's another rider downer. Desperation's got a smell to it. Okay. Desperation got a smell. The worst time to be raising money is when you need it for a deal. So I separate the conversations between teaching what private money is to a potential private lender, human being just like you and me. And then when I've got a deal for them to fund, I then pick up the phone and I call them with what I call the good news phone call. Well, the good news phone call simply tells them four things about the deal. You see, they've already told me how much money they've got to work with and they like the program and they like the rates of return that we pay. I say, well, I'll put your money to work for you just as soon as possible. If they've got retirement funds, I introduce them to the self-directed IRA company in Texas that I recommend for them to move their retirement funds over to, to fund my deals. So then I give them the good news phone call. I call them up and I say, I got great news. I can now put your money to work. I got a house in Newport with an after repaired value of $200,000. The funding for the deal is 150,000. They've already told me they got 150. So I'm matching the deal up to them. Closing's next Tuesday, so you'll need to have your funds wired to my real estate attorney's trust account by next Monday. I'm going to have my attorney email you the wiring instructions. End of conversation. Notice I did not ask them if they want to fund the deal. Of course they want to fund the deal. They've been waiting for the good news phone call for me to put their money to work. And particularly if I have introduced them to the self-directed IRA company and they've moved their funds over. They're waiting for the phone call because they're not making any money until I put their money to work. I love that. That's great. And I agree with you that desperation has the smell for sure. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about, you know, I know talking just a little bit before the show, you'd mentioned that you're primarily in residential, but tell me a little bit about like what a uh, typical deal is and are all these deals that you and your wife are doing together or are you basically helping to raise the money for maybe outside investors that are raising for their own deals? Both. Okay. So all of our personal deals that we invest in are here locally in Eastern North Carolina, but I've got an amazing mastermind family of members in that mastermind elite group, then I work with them personally and I help them raise, you know, money for their deals as well. So I'm doing deals here, but I'm helping other people raise money as well. That's great. What are some of the things in talking with individuals that, you know, maybe they have this nest egg that they've been wanting to put to work? What are maybe some of the misconceptions or things that were surprises to them when it comes to being able to invest in some of your deals? Well, one thing that was so surprising is how easy that we make it for the private lenders to invest with us. In fact, I don't want them to have to do anything except just sit back, collect checks, watch their accounts grow. So being a private lender is just a wonderful way for to be totally passive in real estate to where a private lender doesn't have to go negotiate deals. They don't have to market for deals, find deals. If there's renovations or rehab involved, they don't have to you know, oversee that. So probably the biggest surprise to a private lender when they come on with us is how easy it is. I mean, you know, like if they're going to be using retirement funds to invest and they're not 
happy with the returns or maybe they've got their retirement funds invested in the stock market and they're just sick and tired of the volatility of the stock market. You know, once we explain the program to them and how it works, what they love about it is number one, they make a lot of money more so than, you know, they don't have the volatility in the stock market or in the local CD. Uh, the second thing they love about it is you see, we're not borrowing unsecured funds legally. We can borrow unsecured funds, but we don't borrow unsecured funds. We back every promissory note with a deed of trust or mortgage, one of the same thing that collateralizes the note. We back that note with the real estate. In addition, what they love and they get surprised about is how well they are secured and protected. We name our private lenders on the insurance policy for that property as a mortgagee. You see, the private lender is not a joint venture partner. The private lender is acting in the same capacity as the local bank. And we give our private lenders the same exact security, the same exact protection as the local bank would have. So therefore, they're named as the mortgagee on the insurance policy. If there's ever an insurance claim on that property, the insurance company makes the check payable not only to you, the owner of the property or your entity, but they also make the check payable to the mortgagee. I mean, the private lender has got to sign up on that check. We also give the private lender, make them an additional insured on the title insurance policy in case there's any title issues down the road. So many times these private lenders, in fact, all 47 of our private lenders had never heard of private money or private lending until we taught them about it. And so really the responsibility is on us to really protect and look after our private lenders. Because after all, we're not looking for a short-term relationship. We're looking for a very, very long-term relationship. Some of our private lenders have been with us and still are with us ever since 2009. Oh, wow. Okay. That's pretty amazing. So most of them, they're not familiar at all with the fact that they can be a private lender. Jay, one of the things I always find a little bit surprising, you know, I got my start is in rental property, but I did everything. It was all hands on, right? There's a huge difference between doing that, even though that's how most people seem to start in real estate, than to just participate like one of these investors and not have to deal with the day to day all of those additional things have, as you mentioned, the steady return that comes in. But yeah, tell us, I guess, maybe a little bit about some of the surprises that you've seen there, but also if you don't mind talking a little bit more about the self-directed IRA piece as well. Well, that's huge right there. So here's another writer downer. If you're looking to raise funds for your real estate deals, Establish a relationship with a reputable self-directed IRA company. It's also known as a third-party custodian. And here's the reason you want a relationship with a self-directed IRA company. You see, over half of our 47 private lenders, over half, are using their retirement funds that they already had in place. It was either a 401k from a previous employer or a current employer or they had retirement funds invested in the stock market. So over half of our private lenders already had these retirement funds in place, but they weren't happy with the return. Well, you see, if I didn't already have a relationship with the self-directed IRA company to refer my new potential private lender to, I'd be missing out on over half of my funding. And so I've done business and referred more than one self-directed IRA company to my private lenders. And some have got great customer service and some do not have great customer service. But the important thing is, is for you to have that relationship in place so that when you're talking with a new potential private lender and what I call your warm market or your own network, and you're having a conversation then you learn they have retirement funds that they're not happy with. Well, unless you've got that relationship in place with a self-directed IRA company, you don't have anywhere to recommend or refer these people to, and you'll miss out on that funding. Yeah, that makes sense. And you mentioned a company in Texas. Do you mind mentioning on the show who that is that you typically refer to? Absolutely. Let me tell you something. These people, this company, hands down, are the best. And the reason I can say that is, number one, I have no financial stake in this company. And number two, 
I've got experience with other companies that their customer service was horrible. So here's the name of the company. I recommend you write down their website, check them out. I'll even give you a name to call and talk to. But the company is uh, www.quest, Q-U-E-S-T, trust, with another T, questtrust.com. They're based out of Houston, Texas. They have other satellite locations, but they service the whole nation. Your private lender doesn't have to live in Texas to have an account there. I'll even give you the name. Our representative that we refer all of our new private lenders to is Colin Taylor. Colin Taylor. And I mean personal. He's an IRA specialist. He's been with the company now for about four years. And pretty much any self-directed IRA question you've got, Colin Taylor can answer it for you. They're beautiful with the customer service on their account holders. But let me tell you from my side of the equation why I love them. With Quest Trust, I get my deals funded within three days, three business days. I mean, you know, you borrow traditional funds from the bank or any kind of institutional money. You're pretty lucky if you can get that thing funded in 30 days. And that's even if they are loaning money out. I mean, As of right now, when you and I are visiting, Keith, it's tight out there and the interest rates have gone crazy. But let me tell you something. I've got more private money chasing me today than ever before. I mean, when COVID came along in 2020, I started having even more private money chasing me. But just last week, I got a text from one of my current private lenders that says, Jay, I just came into another $500,000. How soon can you put that to work? Well, isn't that a nice problem to have more money than you can put to work? But again, when it comes to working with self-directed IRA companies and getting your deals funded like that, Quest Trust, hands down, best customer service I've experienced out there. And I've been watching it for a long time. Yeah, I've definitely heard Quest and had them speak at some of the RIAs here in San Antonio. So familiar with them. Let's talk maybe a little bit about the length of time that some of the investments are made for. So in a typical transaction, and I know things can vary from transaction to transaction, but in a typical one, what is the typical amount of time that the money is out lended for? Sure. And that can vary depending on how you want to use the money. Are you doing buy and hold? Are you doing a flip or whatever? But typically my rule of thumb it depends on where the money's coming from. So if the private lender is just using investment capital, liquid capital, you know, funds just laying around in a checking account or a savings account that's earning them like nothing, then we'll make the term or the length of the note two years. And then if it's a retirement funds, and particularly if you want to use it for a buy and hold, then we'll do the term for five years. However, Even though that's what we set the length of the note on, there's a couple of comments I like to make. That term is very flexible, and here's what I mean. First of all, we give our private lenders in the promissory note what's called a 90-day call option. So let's talk about that for a moment. What's a 90-day call option? A 90-day call option means we give our lenders the right that if they have something come along and they need their money, their investment capital, their retirement funds back prior to the note being due, then we just ask for a 90-day notice. And that gives us plenty of time to replace their funds with another one of our private lenders. In fact, we don't even need 90 days. Typically, we can do it within two weeks. But the paperwork says 90-day notice. So even though we set the terms for two years or five years, there's a way they can get their money back with no penalty. You know, most of these programs, if the lender calls the note due early, then there's a penalty, just like putting money in a CD at the bank. But in the way we do it, there is no penalty because we want to just make it simple and very easy for our private lenders to do business with us. On our side of the equation, even though the note is two years or five years, as the borrower, we can pay the note off early in case we cash out prior to the note coming due. However, we do put a caveat in the promissory note where we promise to pay at least six months of interest on that note in the unlikely event we cash out in less than six months. And that's because we want to give an incentive to our private lenders to do business with us because they don't want us to just get in and out, you know, that type of thing. 
Yeah, that makes sense. So let me uh, make sure I heard that correct. Even though you're going for a term of two years, and obviously there may be an opportunity to get out before that, but if you decide to be able to do that, you're still going to pay them six months worth of whatever the interest was going to be. That's right. As an incentive. Now, however, of course, you know, the private lenders, they don't want their money back. I mean, if we pay them off, they get their money back. What are they going to do with the money? Right. They want to keep that money invested. But we also have what's called loan modifications or substitutions of collateral. So if we've got like a smaller note, like thirty thousand, forty thousand, or fifty thousand dollars, maybe in second position or whatever, then we can use that for rehab money. So if we've got another property that we can move that money to, then in that case, we will do just a simple substitution of collateral and keep that note open to where the private lender can keep getting their interest. Okay, now that's neat. And I like the option, you know, even though, as you mentioned, the majority of the lenders are not going to want their money to not be at work. But the fact that you do have that 90 day option to call the note, you know, it seems like it would get the defenses down a little bit as far as, hey, look, my money's not going to be necessarily tied up if I'm not 100% sure I want it to be for two years or five years whatever the term ends up being. So that's kind of a neat spin on it. I had not heard you know, that as being an option. Sure. And again, that just keeps it simple, keeps it easy, because we want our private lenders to know we're very, very flexible to work with. Yeah, for sure. As far as I know you work with quite a few real estate investors, what are maybe some of the misconceptions when it comes to private funds and how to get them that you've seen just in your consulting with various real estate investors? That's a great question, Keith, because my lands, I can sure answer that question because it's, it's very common. I mean, first of all, when a real estate entrepreneur investor has never raised private funds, people ask me all the time, they say, Jay, how do you even start raising private money? I can tell you where you start. You got to get your head straight. I tell people all the time, you can't own real estate until you own the real estate between your ears. So we got to get the mindset right. So what does that mean? First of all, the common miss is rejection. So new real estate investors or seasoned real estate investors starting to raise money, they have this fear of rejection. Well, let me ask a question. How can you be rejected if you're not asking for anything? You see, this is all about leading with a servant's heart. You see, we have over the years, we have received thank you notes in the mail, telephone calls, et cetera, from our private lenders, particularly our elderly private lenders, to where we have been a part of changing their retirement years. One misconception is that private lenders are sophisticated financial people. And that's true in the world of institutional money. But we're not talking institutional money here. We're talking relationship money here is what we're talking about. And so, as I said, all 47 of our private lenders, none of them had ever heard of private money, private lending, self-directed IRAs until, as I said, I put on my teacher hat and I started teaching them what it is. So one myth is who is going to give me money? Who's going to loan me money? And I've never borrowed money before, or I've never done a real estate deal. Who's going to loan me money if that's the case? Well, here's the answer. Another right or downer. If you don't pay the private lender, the property does. If you don't pay the private lender, the property does. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, if you don't pay them, that means they get the property. And we borrow at conservative loan to values. We don't borrow more than 75% of the after repaired value. I didn't say 75% of the purchase price. I said 75% of the after repaired value. That's why we typically bring home a check at closing when we buy a property, because we always borrow more than we need to buy it, particularly if there's going to be a renovation. And so the deal is, here's a nice little double check and balance. When you're paying all cash, and you're paying with private money, if you can't bring home a check at closing from your title company or real estate attorney, you shouldn't do the deal or you didn't buy it at enough of a discount. But back to the myths, fear of rejection. Well, remember, you're leading with a servant's heart. 
You're looking to show people how they can get high rates of return safely and securely in a way that they had never seen before. And you're going to look out for them and you share the program with them. You know, the worst time to be raising private money is when you need it for a deal. So that's why we separate teaching if they're interested and they're going to be interested. They're going to tell you how much they got to work with. If they've got retirement funds, you're going to introduce them to your rep at Quest Trust or whoever you're recommending that they do business with. And then, as I said, you're going to call them up with the good news phone call, put their money to work. So again, the misconceptions are, well, how do I get approved? Well, guess what? You're already approved. There's no application to fill out. And they say, well, how do you know a private lender has approved your deal? Well, there, first of all, there's no applying. Did you know, Keith, since 2009, since I've been in this world of private money, I've never pitched a deal in my life. If I ask somebody if they want to fund this deal, that's the most stupid question in the world I got to ask them. Of course, they want to fund the deal because they've been waiting for the phone call. So it's all about creating win-win scenarios, teaching, being a servant, and looking after your private lender and showing them a way that they never heard of. That's great. And then tell me a little bit about once the lender has borrowed the money to you, are they getting any kind of an update on how things are going? Or I guess I'm sure they're seeing you guys do some type of a payout on a monthly basis, quarterly basis. What does that look like? Sure. So as far as the frequency of payments go, we pay our private lenders either monthly, quarterly, or semi-annual. I used to do annual interest-only payments, but I got tired of those big checks. So I either want to do monthly, quarterly, semi-annual. Now, you can structure your deals if you're doing a flip and you're going to buy it, renovate it, put it in the multiple listing service, and you're going to be in and out in six or nine months. You can let the interest accrue and you don't make any monthly payments. But here's the bottom line. I let the private lender decide how often they want the payments. And here's why. Different private lenders have got different needs and objectives. Some of our private lenders are elderly. They're investing their investment capital and their living or our returns that we're paying them is helping subsidize their income. They don't want to touch their principal amount, but they're needing that monthly to live off of. If I'm borrowing the money from a private lender and they've used their retirement funds and they've moved it over to Quest Trust, then I don't pay monthly. I'll pay quarterly. I'll pay semi-annual. I let them decide. I don't care. They're earning the same amount of money. It's just a matter of how often we write the check because we pay or accrue interest only. We don't pay principal and interest, um, particularly if we're going to be doing a flip because that's a win for the private lender. If they have all their money invested, they're going to make more money. And interest-only payments helps our cash flow. But again, back to your question, Keith, how often do you pay? It comes down to the private lender's objectives. That makes perfect sense. And you're right. If they're doing it through their retirement plan, they're not going to be utilizing the funds that you're paying them anyway, other than continue to grow that account. So that makes sense. And so Outside of that, tell me a little bit about how you're educating people. You mentioned, obviously, your sphere of influence, different places that you're going and you're talking with people. Do you have a program that you put together on how to become a lender? And I don't know if Quest does this, but I know a lot of the self-directed companies are more than happy to kind of help out with any of those conversations as well. But yeah, if you could tell us a little bit about how you're educating the public. Sure. So how do you get the word out? Well, there's multiple ways. So when I first started teaching people in my own network what private money is and private lending is, one of the first things I did is I put on a private lender luncheon over at the Dunes Club, Atlantic Beach. So I teach uh, other real estate investors how to do this. You want to have it at the nicest place that you know your budget will allow. You're going to be buying people lunch. I've got the whole scripting put together as to how you invite people to a private lender luncheon. It doesn't have to be a luncheon. It could be an afternoon or an early evening event. If you've already been doing rehabs, you could invite them out to one of your properties. But I like the luncheons. And the way it works is you're going to buy their lunch. You're going to pay for their lunch. 
And you're going to do about a 20 minute presentation, which I've got a PowerPoint presentation already put together that works beautifully. And at these luncheons, I have raised as much as $969,000 at just one luncheon. And I wasn't pitching any deals, no deals that I'm pitching at the luncheon. I'm simply teaching. I got my teacher hat on and I'm teaching about the program. And of course, at the end of my presentation during that luncheon, I've got an interest form. They can let me know if they're interested or got any other people they want to refer to me. But nowhere in the presentation am I asking, right? Even in the follow-up, when we make the follow-up phone calls, we're not asking for any money. What I'm doing in the follow-up phone call is thanking you for taking your time to come to my luncheon. And please give me some feedback on how I could have made the presentation better. They give me some feedback. And if they're interested, they're telling me. If they're not, they're telling me why without me even asking. Remember, this is no chasing, no begging, no selling, no persuading, simply sharing. So that's one way. And of course, what you want to understand is how your program works. What interest rate are you paying? I say just duplicate my program, which I'm going to mail you my book if you want it. For those of you that are listening, I got the whole program laid out in the book. You just duplicate mine. It seems to work pretty good. But I mean, you can be down at Starbucks. In fact, I went down to Starbucks a few weeks ago. One of my current private lenders invited two other people to Starbucks for me to tell them about my program. Well, I just sat there and drank my coffee and we just had a conversation about what is a private lender, how you can use investment capital, how you can use retirement funds. So just simple conversations. But you know, Keith, your question triggers something else I want to share. And that is, where do you find these people? Where are these people? Who can be a private lender for you? Well, there's three primary categories as to where you find these private lenders. The first category is what I've been talking about, your own network. And of course, there's a direct correlation between how strong your network is and your net worth. So I just started sharing with people in business networking, international, Rotary Club, people I go to church with. That's that category. The second category is what I call your expanded network. So I actually coach other real estate investors on how to grow your network very, very quickly. The third category of private lenders are what we call existing private lenders. So existing private lenders are individuals that are already loaning money out from their personal investment capital or their retirement funds to other real estate investors. Well, where do you find those people? I can tell you where you find them. You find them at self-directed IRA companies. Did you know, like Quest Trust, for example, over 70%, maybe more than that now, but over 70% of their account holders want to loan real estate investors money out of their retirement account. Well, the fourth Wednesday of every month at 7 p.m. Central Time, Quest has a Zoom networking event that's free for their account holders and anybody else that wants to show up and they put you in breakout rooms and you get to meet with each other and network and talk about deals you're doing and they talk about how much money they got to lend out. But here's the difference. Don't miss this. When you're networking with an existing private lender, you are not putting on your teacher hat because they already know what it is. They already know what private money is. They already know what private lending is. They already know what a self-directed IRA is because for goodness sakes, they're already account holder. So now you're not teaching. Now you're negotiating. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And I don't like to negotiate. I like to teach. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. I didn't realize that Quest does that. That's pretty cool. And it's neat that how many companies are utilizing the breakout rooms and stuff within Zoom and some of those. So that's neat. Exactly. All right. And then, well, Jay, is there anything about private lending that I haven't brought up, but that you think is important for the audience to know? Yeah. Who wants to know the hardest thing about raising private money? Here's the answer. Getting started. How do you get started? First of all, Know your program. Know what it is you're teaching. Like when I say your program, what interest rate are you offering people on your deals? How can they get money back early? You know, what's the length of the note? 
So you want to be confident in your conversation, right? Who's going to invest with you if you're not confident in and of yourself? So know your program and have a relationship with a self-directed IRA company that you can refer new potential private lenders to that have retirement funds. And then really the hardest part after those two things is just start flapping your lips. (laughs) I love it. That's cool. All right. Why don't we tell everybody where they can find out more about you? I still have a couple other questions. I want to ask you a little bit about the development of the shopping centers and the condominiums. So I don't want necessarily want to go completely down that rabbit hole, but I'm just curious for myself. But before we get there, maybe we can tell them about how they can get the book and how they can find out more about you. Sure. Well, I would love to give you, if you're listening to this show, I'd love to give you for free my book. It's called Where to Get the Money Now, Where to Get the Money Now, subtitle, How and Where to Get Money for Your Real Estate Deals Without Relying on Traditional Lenders. And you can't get this in an ebook. It's not even available in an ebook. I will mail this to you. In fact, I'll priority mail it to you, three-day priority mail. Believe it or not, Keith, the United States Postal Service is actually still in business. Can you believe that? So I'll ship it out, three-day priority. I'll autograph it for you. All I ask you to do is just cover postage. And here's where you can get the book at www.jayconner.com forward slash book. So I'm an E-R, not an O-R. That's J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash book. And we'll rush it right out to you. Awesome. Fantastic. This has been really an eye opener for myself. And I know it has been for the audience as well. And so certainly take Jay up on that offer for the book. That's kind of the step one, right? Of getting started. So, and then Jay, maybe if you don't mind, I know you're on talking about the private money, but just curious as far as the commercial development and that kind of thing. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about what you're doing in those arenas? Sure. Well, I'm doing nothing in those arenas today, (laughs) but I have been in those arenas. And so when it comes to commercial, of course, commercial is a much longer play. When I say much longer, you know, even if you're buying an existing apartment complex and you're going to do a value add and you're going to, you know, upgrade it, you're going to raise rents, you know, at a bare minimum, you're talking a three year to five year term before you're actually seeing that payout on the back end. A lot of private money is raised for those type of commercial projects. But here's the difference. In the world of single family houses, which is what we've been talking about, and in the world of commercial, here's the difference on raising money. Everything we do with single family houses is what we call one-offs, one-offs. Everything that we do in the world of commercial is what we call syndication. So let's talk for a second about the difference. With single family houses, we're not raising money for a fund. It's a one-off. You've got a private lender or a couple of private lenders that are funding that one single family house. They're getting their own promissory note, their own mortgage or deed of trust, and that's how their investment or their loan is being secured. When you're raising money for commercial, you do what's called syndication. You'll typically have one way to do it is you'll have an SEC attorney develop and write what's called a private placement memorandum. And so that will be the fund that your private lenders will invest in. So they'll invest in that fund. A lot of times there's equity share on the back ends of those projects. So it's a longer term play. So I have developed and built a shopping center from the ground up, from breaking ground years ago, still own that shopping center today, free and clear. So one beautiful thing about a commercial development is because of that one development, it prints now $40,000 per month with me doing nothing, right? $40,000 a month coming in with me doing nothing. How do I do nothing? Well, the property management company is doing all the management and I have the check come to my checkbook. So of course, the advantage to commercial or long-term rentals or long-term rentals, the advantage there is you're building long-term wealth. Now, I am not very excited about the world of commercial right now, and so I'm not playing in that right now. And I've got some friends that unfortunately I think are going to experience a bloodbath 
in the world of apartments that they got into within the past two years. Because coming up to two years ago, you didn't have to have a brain cell in your head to make money in commercial. Well, you had to raise money. But as far as the values of properties going up was insane, unless your commercial property was office. If your commercial property was office, God bless you because of COVID. All those things now are trying to be converted into condominiums and you know other repurposes and whatever. But again, commercial is going to pay you very, very well if the market doesn't turn against you for the long term. I had a bloodbath, bloodbath in a new condominium development that we started back in 2007. And, you know, we sold reservations to investors to invest in the deal. And because the market turned within seven months, it was a bloodbath for seven years following that. So the market and what the market's doing is even more important in the world of commercial than what the market is doing with single family houses. In single family houses, you can get in, you can get out. And if you're buying it for the long term, who cares what the market does? Because you're holding it for the long term. But commercial is a bigger payday, longer term wealth, but comes with higher risk. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, I was just curious on that piece of it. Just couldn't go without asking you about those two. And yes, I would not have wanted to be doing a uh, condominium community deal in 2007. I was a full-time real estate broker at that time. And for me, it was like somebody just shut my income off. It was a tough period of time for sure. Absolutely. I know what it's like to feel the spigot get turned off overnight. But in this world of private money, it chases you. I've got more private money chasing me because people don't know what to do with their investment capital, their retirement funds, and they're looking for a safe place to do it. And of course, that's why we've got the ethical responsibility to relieve them of their problem. There you go. There you go. I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. I appreciate it. I've got two more questions for you that I ask every guest. And one of them would be what advice you would give somebody who's maybe just starting out in their investment journey? Well, that's an easy question with a very important answer. Do not do it the way I did. <laughs> Do not start in this business the way I did. I went my first six years with no mentor and no coach, reading books, out here trying to do it on my own. And I bled hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to figure this out. Get yourself somebody good that knows what they're doing, like Keith that you got here, the host on the show. If not Keith, somebody locally in your area. Join hips with somebody that can be your mentor and walk you through this journey. Do not start out in this journey alone and don't stay in this journey alone. My wife and I are in three different mastermind groups in addition to the mastermind group that we run. It's so important to stay around like-minded people that can help you and you can help them and don't be out there on an island by yourself. That's great advice. I love it. And then one other question is just what book, if any, besides the one we just talked about, <laughs> what book, if any, have you read recently that have been impactful? It doesn't necessarily have to be real estate or investment related, but it certainly can be. Yeah. So my favorite book of recent times is The Go-Giver. Keith, you've probably heard of that book, The Go-Giver. In fact, I had the author on my podcast last year, fantastic interview. It's a short read, but it's all about having a servant's heart and leading first with service. And also, if you'd like to follow me on my podcast and talk more about private money, you can follow me on my podcast on any platform you're listening to podcasts. The name of my show is Raising Private Money. Imagine that. Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. I'm on Spotify, iTunes, all the other hundred that you could think of. Come join me on the show. We do a new show and release one every Monday morning and Thursday morning. We're in our seventh year of Raising Private Money. I interview amazing guests. So who knows? You might hear Keith very, very soon on my show as well. That would be great. That would be great. All right, Jay. Well, I think we will call it a show. I appreciate you being on. Awesome. Keith, thank you so much for having me. God bless you. Yeah, God bless you as well. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconnor.com slash money guide 
That's J-C-O-N-N-E-R dot com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.